Hello and welcome to The World According to Jakai, where I share my opinion about this world, but trust me, I am not of this world. Welcoming another guest on the podcast, Jeff Whitaker. A lot of you all in the Auburn community may know him from playing football here at Auburn University from 2010 to 2014. Although, He's still a student now, continuing his legacy, about to pursue his business degree in the fall at grad school. He's working with War Eagle Plus. He's working on his own podcast, Life After the Fourth Quarter. After this interview, I got to know him as a man who is deeply engulfed in his faith, a man who is inspired daily by his mother and uses that inspiration to pour into others constantly, specifically athletes. He reminds them that the game is never over when you stop. The game of life continues, and you can continue to be the best version of yourself if you just continue to believe in yourself. Without further ado, please let me know what you think in the comments down below about this Jeff Whitaker interview. Jeff, and welcome to the world according to Jakai. Thank you for being here today. It's good. It, uh, it feels good to be here. I appreciate the. We've been talking about this for like a couple of weeks now. So, we have. yeah, I love it. I'm Probably more than a couple of weeks. More, I feel like it's been like <laughs> some, a, months. A, a, some months. <laughs> right. Because I was going to say, the first time I met you was in our news and sports announcing class. Rick Smith the, was our performer. The GOAT. Shout out to you, Rick. <laughs> we love you. Um, so in that class, I remember seeing you walk in, and I'm like, he looks really scary. Like, <laughs> he looks really scary. Oh, no. You're more than just your past. I know that you used to play football right. here. You're still in school now here, but I want them to know that about you. So, But it's kind of funny because... Yes, even though we met last semester mm -hmm. in that class, <clears throat> you knew my dad mm -hmm. before you knew me. So can you tell them a little bit about that? So um, I am from the great state of Georgia that I, I'm, I'm always repping. I had an opportunity to go and do a camp in the summer with a pro, uh, ex pro football player, and it was Takeo Spikes. And um, some of his people, some of the, we knew mutual people. And so once that connection was made in Auburn, and um, I was actually was able to uh, go down to Washington County, and um, and we was I, I was able to see his house. He showed me his house. Um, I tried to knock on Chipper Jones' uh, um, door. <laughs> he told me that's that we don't they don't do that. I'm like, well, they do it in my neighborhood. He's like, no, we don't do. That. Jeff, don't go over there. Don't don't do that. <laughs> so. Um, Saw, saw the crib and then went to uh, Washington County. Of course, it was like a lot of people um, and help out the kids and got a chance to get some home cooking from his mom, <laughs> from your grandmother. Yes. And um, she was very uh, tough <laughs> and straightforward. Tell them about <laughs> so it. So she was very tough and straightforward. I, when I saw how she talked to him, because she was telling him he basically needed to get out of the way, and she used some other words how he needed to get out of the way. <laughs> and I was like, and she looked at me, she's like, you going to eat? I'm like, I, if the sun got that, I don't even know what I'm going to get. <laughs> like, I'm just here. I'm just here so I won't get fined. You know, right. at this point, like, I'm just here. But we, we they, they had a big fish fry, and, and it was just amazing. So, like, I just always remember that. And then the, the first time I saw you, was I think he was inducted to the Alabama Sports Hall of Fame. Yes. So I was at the Auburn table. Oh. <laughs> and he got emotional when he started when he yes. was talking about you. Yeah. Yes. You told me this before. Yeah, yeah. yeah. He got emotional when he mm -hmm. when he started talking about what he wanted to do and and the whole nine. So that was super, super dope to see. So. Yeah. Uh, but the secret that I did tell him after I saw him this year, I said, dude, I said. Hey, man, you and her mom, y'all did a good job. Oh. He said, 
appreciate it, man. <laughs> <laughs> Thank yeah, you, so Jeff. Yeah, no I appreciate that. Yeah. You're very well connected. Very well connected. <laughs> That's what they say. You are. <laughs> I mean, anyone who goes to Auburn University, I mean, I won't speak for everyone, but there's a lot of people who are like, oh, I know Jeff, I know Jeff, I know Jeff. Yeah. You have touched so many people's lives, and recently, this past weekend, right. You touched some more lives. <laughs> um, so you actually officiated a wedding for mm -hmm. Jonathan Jones, Auburn alumni, mm -hmm. two-time Super Bowl champ for the Patriots, mm -hmm. and Miss Andressa Jones. Oh, yeah. So how was that? Well, me and Jonathan were, were very close. Um, um, when I'm a couple years older than him, um, so I was here from 10 through 14. And so when he came in, uh, we always joked. I said, man, you came in the wrong time. He came in 2012. That was his first year. Yeah. Uh, of course, we was terrible that year. But um, I want to say in 13, it was 13, 13, when, 13 to 14, we was hurt. And, and I was battling injuries from 12 and on. That was one of those years that when we was battling injuries together, we just – Got even closer. He's from Carrollton. I'm from Macon. Um, um, of course, he graduated from Carrollton High School. I graduated from Warren Robins High School. So just that Georgia connection on one end. Then number two, um, he just he was a good guy. Just yeah. a good good dude. And at the time while we were in college, at the time when we were single, hey man, he was the perfect person that I could call. And say, hey Jay, <laughs> I need I need you right now. I need you to come on over here. And I said, when well, my little brother come in, he gonna take the whole room. Mm -hmm. He gonna take the whole room. So we 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 became close in college, and then after college, he went off um, into the NFL, and we stayed in contact. And then probably the last for years we we got even closer and so um in jay jones fashion it wasn't six months before the wedding mm -hmm. it was about five weeks <laughs> 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 before the wedding because the, the 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 story behind it or well, i was going to be in the wedding mm -hmm. but when when everybody had to go get fitted for their suits I'm the only lineman in this wedding, so you know the 52-inch chest. Everybody don't got that, so it's so for me to get fitted um, with one of the um, with one of the particular the, the 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 suits that they wanted to wear. Um, they just had 48, so I said, "Listen, you can either get Incredible Hulk at your wedding, All right. <laughs> or hey, I'm, I'm still coming. I'm gonna still I'm gonna still support you." And then he said, well, me and my lady, we kind of been thinking um, about something uh, before, but I got a big ass. So he texted me. He said, I got a big, I got I to gotta ask you a big question. And um, normally, we normally just text and we miss each other because he's a pilot also. So when, oh, wow. Yeah, so when he's flying, so... He's a pilot. I, I told him I won't, I won't double date with him because they they fly to they may fly to Florida to go to mm -hmm. dinner and fly back. But uh, he's a pilot also. So while he was flying, when I was trying to reach him and then working with um, Warwick Productions, sometimes I'm on set doing it, so the phones is off. And uh, about three days later, we got a hope to each other, and he asked me. He said, "Hey, man, me and my." Yeah, I said, we've been talking, and we would love if you, um, you don't have to say yes. You know, anytime somebody say that, you go, mm -hmm. you don't have to say yes, but we would love for you to uh, officiate the wedding. And I was like, absolutely, absolutely. The first, the first hour after I hung up, I was nervous. I was like, oh, my God. I went online and did the, got the certificate, got, got official, you know, did what I need to do to be official. Um... The unique thing about it was um, they got married March 16th, and March 16th is 19 years of my mom's burial. And the, the thing that my mom, um, one thing that she, if you said, I want your son to, he could be a preacher, or he could make a lot of money playing football, or she would be a preacher every, every, I mean, it was, it, so it was a cool way to kind of honor her. Um, in that role, and most importantly, 
to honor, you know, um, Jonathan and Andressa on that special day. So um, I think it intensified as the day got closer to realizing how big um, of an ask that is, how special a person got to think of you to, to, to do that. So he's more than just a teammate. He, he's literally my brother um, from another. Like we always <laughs> say my brother from another mother. So yeah. yeah. I, I will say you're an amazing storyteller. <laughs> like that story, yeah. I, I, I love listening to your stories because they're just so detailed. I feel uh. like I could see it all <laughs> panning out. So how did growing up in Macon, Georgia mm -hmm. impact who you are as a man today? Macon, Georgia is everything to me. Um, mm -hmm. I, I love um, my city. I was born and raised and I'm from, my whole family is from the East Macon area. So in Macon, if you ever want to know what side of town it is, it's just the school. So it's Southwest, Northeast, <laughs> um, um, West Side. <laughs> like it's literally, yeah. when you start to know for some of the, the, the pillars uh, central and you know so um, all of my family went to Northeast High School pretty much my mom my dad's side went to Southwest okay. so growing up um, pretty much with a my dad was active but I grew up in a single parent household and and um, early in, uh, in my um, upbringing my dad was more out than in yeah. um, um, as I always say my dad wasn't the best of small kids but he's the best of young adults, mm -hmm. you know. So, uh, but growing up faith-based, um, um, in a faith-based church, spirituality with my mom, and um, she didn't play either. Um, she was one of those moms that she's tough on you, and then when she answered the phone, she's the sweetest lady in the world. And you just like cap. <laughs> so, stop oh, faking. Stop faking the whole time. And, and, but tough. I, my older brother is six years older than me, so my brother was kind of like the father figure mm -hmm. as well. Um, nothing but respect. So, Macon is a tough, gritty, like especially where where where, where I grew up at um, area, and it just taught me a lot about um, you, you, about facing the challenge. Yeah. You don't back down from it. You take pride in who you are, um, especially not only the the area I grew up in, but the household I grew up in. And so making it was a bunch of trials and tribulations. Um, there were some happy times as well, but mm -hmm. you know, uh, being in the environment, drug infested environment, gang affiliated environment, and um, me and my cousin, who's like my day one, who is my day one, uh, Quintez, we were just pretty much back to back. And, and um, I think right now, I just turned 32, so right now, and he's turned 32 in the summer. We were just talking about it. We were the only people in, in the surrounding area that didn't have a felony, that didn't, went, that didn't go to jail, you know, graduated high school. I ended up graduating college, so stuff like that. So, so yeah. Why do you think <clears throat> that was possible? Well, we were scared of our moms. <laughs> so <laughs> I think, number one, I think we were... We lived in the hood, but our mindset was never the hood. Mm -hmm. So, through through respect, you know, and, and the power of respect is to never disrespect. And that was one thing that we was taught very mm -hmm. early on. And I'm not saying we was the most innocent kids in the world, but at the same time, we respect authority. Right. And um, we knew, and then for my, my pops, my pops never, I had to put his hands on me, but I mean, he was 6'3", 280 in his prime. I mean, when he said sit down, your whole body shook. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it was just, I just knew for on my end, and then I know on Quintez's end, we just knew it was going to be a lot of consequences. Right. Uh, so we was never scared of the principal or the teacher or the mm -hmm. boys across the hall or in the classroom. We were scared of the person that we had to go and cross the dose hill. <laughs> so I think that's, I think that was a big reason why um, we kind of turned out the way we did. 
That's that's relatable, I will say. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Don't play. Don't play. Don't play. Yeah. <laughs> you graduated from Auburn University mm -hmm. in 2014, mm -hmm. getting your undergrad, your degree in communications. Right. Now you're back in school, about to pursue, getting your business degree, graduate, getting, going to graduate school in the fall. Mm -hmm. How has your perspective changed? Well, I would say with school, the first time when I was, you know, the goal was to, I always wanted to play football. Like, mm -hmm. so, so I always wanted to play football, like losing mom early, things of that nature. Um, and football was a safe haven. I know we'll get into it, but football was a safe haven for me. Mm -hmm. And so I never really had, it's crazy, I never really had crazy aspirations of, I just felt like if you playing ball, you might as well, I should want to go to college, you know, right. when I realized I could do it. And from playing college ball, I thought, all right, might as well go to the pros, you know, if, if this was, you know, what I could do. Uh, so my perspective, especially from school, it was just like, well, I'm going to get something. Like, I'm not going to play ball and not get nothing, like. If I'm going to play ball, I'm going to get a degree, too, you know. And I don't want to, I want to major in what I want to major in. And so it was communication, and it was, um, I literally made, I was started off in business, but I majored in communication because of, I didn't know him at the time, but I saw a black guy on TV, and it was Stephen A. Smith. Mm. And I said, what did he major in? And they said, I was like, maybe communication. I was like, all right, I'm going to major in that. Oh, wow. Literally. And and, mm. and T.J. Jackson, Dr. Jackson now, who had played here, went on to the league, he was working um, with uh, students. And he said, well, I see the way you react with your nephew. You might want to minor in social work. Mm. And I minor in social work and did things for Braveheart, um, did things for with the um, assistant living um, with, with the elderly, and so wow. it's pretty cool. So the first time it was just, I'm gonna get something back. This time the pers perspective has changed because I know priority. Yeah. My first time I went, I went big on a lot. It was a lot of last minute rush, playing some ball. We we had a couple of runs during my time here, so it's a lot of excitement um, for the most part. But with this time around has just been prioritizing, understanding that, hey, this is what I'm going to study, understanding, you know, finishing the first semester with a 3-0, and then now it's going to surpass that, you know, with the second semester. So, and but the, my perspective this time around, I'm doing it for my mom. Yeah. Um, it's, she, is the, she is the key in um, being able to come back. Uh, shout out to President Chris, Rich McGlynn, for being able to uh, point me into the right direction, we'll be able to come back and pursue another degree. That's cool. Yeah. I was actually just talking to Patrick Meadows. <laughs> <laughs> he's been one of your classes. Yeah. <laughs> when I told him that I was interviewing him, he's like, oh my gosh, it's going to be so good. <laughs> he was like, every time when he enters into our class, it's early in the morning, he'll be like, hey, and we're like, Hey, but we love him for it. Love it. Why are you so positive, and why do you, just entering into the classroom, entering into any atmosphere, why do you feel like it's important to be like, hey, how's your day? Like, why do you do that? When I was a kid, I always just had a positive vibration about myself. Um, always creative in how I'm thinking. Always, um, just always thinking huge. Yeah. Um, and so what I realized, the re I feel like the reason why I am like that is because I want to be a rainbow in somebody's cloud mm -hmm. because I had a lot of rainbows in my cloud. Right. So it's like a reciprocity, you know, I'm just putting it out because I know I get it back. And, 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 and understanding that, you know, um, I just know that somebody asked me how I was doing and they really cared. And I just think that a lot of times, you know, it's just... Sometimes it's, it get cliche. It's how you doing? I'm good, yeah. But it's like you know, I think you could feel when somebody really care, yeah, and, and asking how you doing, and and I just feel like uh, if we're gonna live this life, let's let's have a positive um, outlook. I believe that you control your, <clears throat> you're in control. You're more in control than what you think. 
Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. So I think that um, as far as the universe concerns, a lot of, it's so much bigger than you, which I, I feel that I get to control how um, I put my positive thoughts out into the world. And so if I got a choice between negative and positive, positive I'm going to choose positive every time. I love that. that. That's something that I'm actively working on, choosing positivity every single day. I, yeah. I love that about you. I think some people just have it in their personality oh, naturally, right, and right. some other people have to work harder on it. Right. So now transitioning. Okay. You're now mm. working with War Eagle Productions. Right. Can you tell us what all your job entails? And also, how has this journey been for you? It's been great. I mean, when I first, my first semester, I was, it was kind of like, um, you just kind of just picking and choosing. Maybe do you want to go the administration route? And I think probably my first week into it, I was like, no. <laughs> but, <laughs> but you know, you, you, you work at it, you, 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 you know, you be a team player, mm -hmm. and um, you, you're grateful for the opportunity. But production has always been um, a key for me, um, a person who kind of all, with a big personality, but kind of shot away from the spotlight. Right. And, and, and wanted to just to know that the, the, the behind the scenes. So with War Eagle Productions, uh, mostly War Eagle Plus, um, Andrew Aaron, he's, he's an amazing boss. So I'm learning um, uh, Premiere Pro. I'm, I'm, so I'm, I'm the intern. Yeah. So I'm, I'm, I just came from taping um, from the, the 16 millimeters films that we're going to get ready to digitize. So oh, wow. ordering them, logging. So my, on, on the week to week basis, I'm going to um, help produce um, the Talking Tigers podcast with uh, Annie Bertram. So all the, wow. when, he, when he interviews all the coaches, I'm doing, I'm making sure the camera shots from one and two. Mm -hmm. um, and then I would cut that up and send it off um, to Andrew. And he may have some um, very honest opinions on, on how my cut ups <laughs> are sometimes. And uh, so I, I'm doing that with the uh, 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 This Week in Auburn um, um, sports. Um, also, to get rid of launch a podcast on the platform with um, Fourth Quarters with Jeff Whitaker. And um, and we just, we did a pilot so with Jonathan Jones. It went well, so we're going to keep that going. And, that, and I'll be interviewing former, uh, um, former football players and current football players. And so, okay. so <clears throat> just kind of, you know, it's the spring, you know, I play ball, just kind of get the feet wet, and then maybe in the summer we may go to other sports, things of that nature. So that's pretty much what I'm doing. Nice, <laughs> nice. I'm excited for that podcast. Though, Thank right? you. I'm Thank excited. you. I am. I am. I told you. I think it'll be. I think it'll be a good hit. It will. Yeah. Do you have advice for athletes who are looking to gain more exposure when it comes to their NIL? I think the advice is I would, is to hook on funnest rules as far as what I call the kindergarten rules, as your mom and your grandmother, your dad, or granddad would teach you. But just understand that you represent more than yourself. Okay. It is name, image, likeness. And so um, there's no likeness without a good name. Right. There's no likeness <laughs> without a good image. Right. <laughs> and so I think the for my advice would be for athletes is to keep the main thing the main thing and to be respectful. Um, I am an athlete that had uh, talent that could be able to play ball and, and felt like that talent was going to be able to lead me to a future in ball. Mm -hmm. But due to injuries and, and setbacks, um, I was able to hone, hold on my deg degree. However, I'm back simply because of the way I treated people. I don't care what nobody says. I think I am the reason why I got another opportunity to pursue and we'll finish this graduate in August is because the way I treated people. I always say this. I don't think I ever be the richest man in the world because I give so much. And I don't think I be the poorest man in the world because I give so much. <laughs> so yeah. When you talk about giving so much, mm -hmm. on your LinkedIn, I saw that you're also invested in being a mentor mm -hmm. in athletes' lives, mm -hmm. letting them know the athlete never dies. Right. They just find other ways. That's your quote from the LinkedIn. <laughs> Absolutely. So 
why is it important for an athlete to think about your podcast, as you said, after the fourth quarter? Mm -hmm. Why is it important for an athlete to think about life after the game? It's, it's very important. I think the biggest myth that athletes have is that we we really don't think that we are, are enough outside of the sport. And the reality of it is one thing that sports teaches you, it teaches you how to work with people. Mm -hmm. It teaches you how to work with people that get on your nerves. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it teaches you how to come together and to be able to achieve. One thing I love about football, because you got all these different personalities coming together to achieve a goal. Right. And um, so it, it allows you to understand unconsciously partnerships and relationships because you needed a coach, you needed a teacher, you needed a trainer, you needed, it's this, for, for whatever type of superstar you are or whatever type of just a good individual, you needed somebody. And so the athlete never die. I think that uh, the mentality, I think the reason why it's so important is to let the athletes know that you're so much more. Um, but don't, it's okay to stand on the, 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 the principle and a firm foundation that I played sports right. and I enjoyed it. And, and I was good at it. And I was good at it. <laughs> and I'm taking these things that I learned in the sport and I apply it to life because I don't think the athlete understands that. See, in our world, in the athlete world, 430 is early. Mm -hmm. You know, that's, you know, you need to make the 530 workout. You need to be up by 430. Mm -hmm. You don't be like, you get punished, you get penalized, you know. So it prepares you, so when the real world, you gotta think about it, the real world is the nine to five. So technically, you already got four hours on the world before they even wake up. So the athlete teaches you, I think the athlete, being an athlete, it teaches you unconsciously that um, if you put a goal in mind, you set, set, put some goals out there and um, meet those expectations. Mm -hmm. What's a testimony from an athlete that you've mentored? If you don't mind sharing, you do not have to share it. I, have to <laughs> I would, I wouldn't put the name on it. Yeah, don't. Um, but I just, I know that. Um, I think in the end of the day, for one, I think my purpose, one, my purpose is to be able. To, how can I glorify God, right? Right. In everything I do, and so I'm not trying to be perfect. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not trying to kiss up to people. I'm gonna be who I am. Right. But glorify meaning all the gifts that I was given. I'm gonna just give it back, right? right. And so, um, um, and I think a part of that purpose is to be able to l let the athlete know that you're okay, you're gonna be okay, it's gonna be some trials and tribulations. So I, I, I have had the experience to quote unquote mentor uh, uh, some athletes and I just think that, I remember one in particular that I, w I was a um, volunteer like coaching at one point, and I remember this guy, he wasn't in it. He wasn't in it. It was just like, and you know, a few people went off on him, and I'm like, well, respectfully so. But I'm like, I came to him, I'm saying, man, how you doing? What's going on? And he had to tell me his grandma had passed, and he just found out. Mm -hmm. But a part of it was the athlete I'm too prideful to say but my emotions is so strong that I can't hide it. <laughs> I can't hide it. So it's like, oh, no, no, no. So what I did was I literally just hugged him, mm -hmm. and he cried on my shoulder. Mm -hmm. And it was just saying, hey, man, we're good. Uh, take a deep breath. Um, everything's going to be all right. Um, and it's okay for you to feel how you feel right now. Mm -hmm. It's just not okay to stay there. But it's okay to feel it. It's okay to feel it. And he finished practice. And um, a similar situation that I had with another guy, he didn't think he was gonna be able to play college. He wanted to play college one day. And experienced some injuries and things of that nature and thought that would make stop him. And over here, I was blessed. I had an offer since my sophomore year. So, I, so still to, to a degree, I, even though I know a lot about recruiting, from my personal experience, it's like I, I still haven't felt some of the things that a guy may feel when you get to your senior year and you only have two offers or two offers or you got two teams looking at you and one may offer. 
Bob Miller telling that kid that like he's going. I, I knew he was a stand up kid. Mm -hmm. I'm like, oh yeah, you're gonna be okay. And to, to, to for him to go to school and, and and get invited to his signing day and things of that nature. So yeah, so those are those are some key ones. Mm -hmm. yeah. How do you plan to be the bridge between athletics, academics, and business? Whew. Um, the way I plan to be the bridge between athletics, academics, and business is to be present mm. and to uh, literally be the bridge. And sometimes the bridge means you got to build to the other side. And present is um, understanding that it's okay to not know, but let's walk through it together. Let's see what, I, I was just in the airport even coming back from um, the wedding and just bumped into a couple of basketball players, you know, playing college ball and things of that nature. And we was talking, one of the guys said, hey, can I get your number? I was like, what? He's <laughs> like, yeah, you just seem like somebody I just need to just hear yeah. from from time to time. I'm like, absolutely. But I think those things, they don't just random happen. Right? So I think that the, the way is just to be able to be present and and be knowledgeable, not just as far as what the athlete can get, but be knowledgeable of who they are. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, I think sometimes, um, it's, I think is the athlete game sometimes, it seems like it ran by a bunch of hustlers, <laughs> you know? And real fast and talking fast mm -hmm. and doing this and doing this. And it's like, you know, sometimes I think that the, how I could be able to be a bridge is to s slow it down, be present, yeah. listen, yeah. understand, and see where we could go. I love that. Mm -hmm. In high school, you were ranked number 17 defensive <laughs> tackle in the nation by ESPN <laughs> and number seven in Georgia. Mm -hmm. So my question to you is why Auburn? Because I'm sure you were highly recruited. Mm -hmm. So why Auburn? Tracy Rocker. So it took an Auburn man to get me. He was very honest. Um, Tracy Rocker, Gene Chizik. Um, I had, um, I didn't know what Auburn was. I think I picked up the phone on accident. He had called me. <laughs> and I picked up the phone. I was just like, hello? And he was, he had this country slang. And I was like, okay. Visit Auburn, oh, uh, I don't know. Where, where is it? He's like, it's just two hours away. I'm like, two hours, okay. Now we, all right, I can do two hours, you know. Um, visited, met him, met Coach Chiswick, and um, it just started a, that was my, going into my senior year. Um, met them, um, came to a couple of games, and it just felt, it felt, because then I knew my teammates who was coming in with me, that 2010 class, who we still think the best class that came through. But, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, we, uh, we, we had bonded together, and it just felt home away from home. Mm -hmm. um, I wasn't going to go. I actually told Coach Rocker uh, that I was going to, I was going to stay in state and go to my state school. And... Um, he said, you got to call me back. That don't sound right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, I know it all because Chizik calls, and he left a nice voicemail. He's like, they're going to have to bury me in the box. <laughs> I, you, you're going to be man enough to call me, and you know, mm -hmm. so in, in, in a Gene Chizik way. But uh, I think the reason why at first I was kind of afraid because they was preaching so much leadership, mm -hmm. and I just wanted to play ball. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, what? And he's like, you're gonna be my bell cow, and and you know, and they really spoke a lot of things into existence as oh, far as wow. you know, as far as leadership, as far as uh, I think that's what that's the beautiful thing about great coaches. Great coaches kind of see the future and know that all right, this guy, he don't know what he has right now, but they're gonna follow him, you know. And so yeah, that it felt like home away from home. I love that. <laughs> so from 2010 to 2014, mm -hmm. you graduated, mm -hmm. coming back. Mm -hmm. What was the most, or what would you say is like the most memorable moment that you feel like you have 
at your time at Auburn? The first time or now? I would say your first time. Um, or both. I would say the, have one. the first time was just being able to, we was a confident group coming into school. This is no lie. We knew as a class that we'll get a national championship. Mm-hmm. Now, we didn't know it was going to be right off the bat, you know, when we came in. But it was um, the most memorable thing was I never been around a group of 18, 19 year olds with that much confidence. Mm-hmm. I mean, it was, and when you're young, it's sometimes it's blind confidence, you know, what you don't know. But it was a hundred percent effort, a hundred percent commitment, very tight. Um, the older guys didn't like us, <laughs> and we didn't care, <laughs> right, right, right. But it was uh, because it was real too, like Darvin Adams, Nick Farrelly. Um, from the D line, I didn't have to experience that, but I know other positions they had to kind of experience some things. But um, but we was back to back as a class, so it was some of the most memorable. Deal. And to, to go to two national championships, and we were so close to to win two. Um, that by far is the most memorable, and to have my former roommate Chris Davis to 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 have a legacy moment that will be forever. Um, that was um, that was pretty incredible. The build up before the kick six moment. Um, what was going through my mind? I was not on the field. I was went to get some Gatorade, because I was actually hurt during that time. I I went to get some Gatorade, and um, it was a lot of, a lot was going on, so get some Gatorade, and we're like, he's gonna kick it? So in my mind, I'm thinking, we're gonna win this game, because he clearly don't wanna go to overtime. But then they started getting the word around that this was supposed to be like a new kicker, and he could kick real far. So a part of it was a little nervous, like, okay. But I just knew deep down inside, I'm like, for Coach Saban to, to kick this field goal with this 57-yard field goal, like, yeah, we won. Because if he already, he's filled the momentum, the momentum, the, the, it was electric in, in the stadium, and it, the, we had all the momentum in the world. And uh, when, when, they, when they kicked it, immediately when Chris caught it, I was thinking, overtime. <laughs> this is overtime, perfect. Only thing we gotta do is just be, you know, um, get some first downs, get a touchdown, get it in there, we're good. And he keep running. Not a crap, not like the sideline kind of, we're kind of into it. Half, half, I would say some of it, half was in the whole time, like running back, running back, running back. But it was a more, maybe more than half was like, okay, okay. Okay, <laughs> and then once he hit the sideline, it was like, you got to be kidding me. So the first thing as a player, the first thing I'm looking for is flags. Like at this point, it got to be a flag, but at this point, it can't be a flag. Like, and so once he kind of cleared the sideline, once he tight wrote the sideline, it was, so while I was injured, I had restrictions restrictions on what I can and can't do. And running was something I definitely could not have done. Well, I did it. I, I, ran, I ran. I ran. I was on the, the bottom of the pile with them. But what a lot of people don't know about that is when you're on the bottom of the pile, you can't breathe. So it was like, to the point like it was low key kind of panicking a little bit saying everybody's happy and then more people piling on. It's like, no, 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 no. So I always tell this story, I don't know if he gonna like me for saying it, but I know Chris, but let me say it again. I know Chris Davis Jr., all right? I know him, <laughs> I know him real well. So for him to be about to suffocate on the bottom of that pot, it didn't matter that he just scored this big, you know, one of the biggest moments in sports history. He was hot. He was hot. I mean, he was so, because you got to think about it, it's a cold game, it's November. When he, when we got everybody, and it was just him, 
it was just nothing but steam just coming from from his head because he was so up under that pile like it was just like he was just trying to get his breath and I was like no no, no we can't do that right now <laughs> well, whatever you think is uh, hi, who you want to tell we can't no, no 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 not right now not right now so for about the first 20 or 30 yards I walked with him I walked with him right out there and then I was I had my folks there, my brother and all that. And then when Coach Lolly came by, and I know him and Coach Lolly got a great relationship, I kind of eased out the way and let Coach Lolly um, be right there. I kind of joke sometimes. I'm like, I could have been there the whole time. <laughs> you know, I didn't know the interview and all that was going to happen right then and there. But Coach Lolly is him and I think Coach Fountain are the guys who's kind of from the – post-game interview, all that stuff. And, but it was um, it was just one of those moments that, for me, I still, when I think about it, I'm so happy for Chris. Like, because he's a super, super genuine person. He's very tough. Um, he has this persona that's very tough. I was never afraid of, by the way. Just want to throw that out there for, for so I, I tell him all the time, I'm, not intimidated at all. So, you know, uh, but he has this tough persona that um, that breeds um, excellence as far as competition. Um, I always said the running joke was, no matter how good you was, we didn't really know. You, you had to get the, the green light from Chris, kind of determine how, how good you were. I am extremely happy that it happened to him because he worked so hard. He drowned his, some of his deep thoughts into his work. So a lot of people didn't get a chance to understand and get to know Chris Davis Jr. But I know the person. And so for that to happen to the person, it was, it was amazing. And, and, and for it to happen, and still, like, see him do an interview. Chris wasn't doing no interview. To see him do interviews, to see him, like, yeah, it's, like, it's, it's so amazing. And I just think it was a way of, like, being able to show his amazing. Because he got, he, he has a personality, too. And, um, but he's real. Like, Chris being a dad, that, like, it makes sense. Like, <laughs> like absolutely. He's, finally, he gets to boss somebody around. You know what I mean? Like, absolutely. But he's great at that, you know. He's great at that. At, um, and shout out to CJ who just turned 14, his son. But he he is. Um, I could go on and on and on talk about Chris, but Chris is by far one of my favorite teammates, and um, he is just uh, a guy who, for that to happen and for his own story, I want to get too much because he has a unique story himself. I think. For, for, for me to know his story for what it is and for that to happen, God is good. I don't think it was something by luck that play, even that year was just special. I don't think it's something by luck. Um, I just feel like it was a special bond and there's a team that we just had like a band without break mentality. We genuinely cared about the other person being like how you doing you we know the story we we, we we know in a lot of ways what make them cry what make them go like so when you have been on the team and then plus for the older guys we had already won before so it was nothing that we was we wasn't shy or scared or, or, or afraid of like locking in and going to get it no, so it was a, so the when I think about the team, it wasn't luck. It was just more of, um, it was just a determination to will ourselves to be something better than other people's expectations. Plus, for the kick to happen, I try to tell people this, this is a simple math. Chris Davis was the best return man in all of college that year. So it's even more not lucky <laughs> <laughs> that the best return man in college received the kick and he did what the best return man in college would do. And, uh, because he always uh, felt 
so did others, felt that he should have been in retirement a little bit earlier <laughs> in his career because he was pretty he's pretty good. He's pretty good. And um and that's 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 the that's the nice way of saying it. Chris would probably had a different direction of saying he was pretty good that was probably pissed some people off. <laughs> but uh but I just yeah, I just think for 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 that team to go as far as we did to come up 13 seconds away from um second national championship in like three years and spending like three years. Um it's, however, as we have got older, we have realized that it's still pretty special. You know, to win the SEC championship, still pretty special to win 12 games. However, we just, we didn't, I feel like we the, my group here at Auburn was like, from 10 to 14 was like that, the blink of, we had a group of guys who thought a little different, who um, embraced tradition but wanted to be remembered at the same time, and who was so elated to see the other person win. Because we fought with each other all the time. Like on both of those championships teams, we fought. You would, you know how you like you, you go to the dinner and, and you like you can't believe that they're brothers and sisters or they're, they're two brothers because they just fight all the time. But if somebody said something to either person, then we would flip the script. It, that, that's how it was with like the games. It's like before the games, oh man, we was all you know you thank you and you know boom boom boom. boom. But when it, something happened, when it get like Thursday. So, Hey man, I'm praying for you. <laughs> I really want to. You know, after you go through like a Bible study group with chat on Friday, it's like, hey man, I'm you know, with tears in your eyes, you're like, I'm gonna play, I'm gonna play for you. And Monday you go, but you, I can't stay. You just, you know, but that's that's the beauty of that team. But also a moment of silence for Ladarius Phillips and Ed Christian who lost their lives when they was here. And um, from from at a party, so it's just you know with Auburn, it was my memory, it's memories, because it was like the highest, the lows, being injured, but me being injured uh, introduced me to leadership, and I never really took it on until I got injured, and so um, I, I tell you this, if I didn't get injured, I don't know what I officiate the way, I don't know what we have that. Some of those moments that we had in college that led to uh, life after school, and so um, everything happens for a reason. Um, and being back, I'm just grateful. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm extremely, extremely grateful. And, I, and me being back, it was just off of me, and President Chris, conversation. While playing Auburn at, in 2013, you already mentioned your injury. Mm -hmm. So you had surgery on your right knee, and in 2014, you had back surgery. Mm -hmm. What advice do you have for athletes who are recovering from an injury? Hang in there. Okay. Um, really, uh, the, the, the pra what I'm practicing now about positivity, yeah. positive thought, like just keep it positive. They understand that setbacks will happen mm -hmm. through injuries. Um, but just know that, like, you're going to be able to move around. You're going to, because especially if you never got hurt before. Right. It could be a very mental um, drain, but it's just like, I would just tell them, hang in there. Um, everything is going to get back to where it needs to get back to. And take that same work, that same mentality that you had when you was on the field, apply it to rehab every day. When you go in that training room, apply it like, Really, whatever, if they said uh, you're going to be out for six months, make it five. Like, compete with yourself. Mm. But also understand, 100% set, setback will happen mm. in, in the rehab process. Like, mm -hmm. you may, it may be a week that you can't do nothing because it's just whoa. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it, it's your body. So just, just hang in there. Mm -hmm. What about the game of football mm -hmm. made you fall in love? Physicality. I love the physical nature of football. 
that simple. <laughs> I love contact. I love coming off the ball mm -hmm. and putting my hands on somebody. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. And so it was, and for a person who, like I said, I, when I lost my mom, it was, you, you, you needed the outlet. And yeah. football was the outlet. Mm -hmm. Who are some mentors that you cherish in your life? Who? Um, my brother, older sister, my bro, so I grew up, um, and I realized, I thought everybody was like this, but I grew up, so my mom had two boys, six years apart. She was in a relationship, she had my brother, she was in another relationship, she had me. But when my brother would go with his dad, I would go, sometimes, you know? Because I'd be like, I wanna go. And so I was introduced to uh, his, on that, on that side of the family, so his older sister is my older sister as well. Oh, wow. And so she is a pillar. Um, she uh, she is the unsung hero, uh, one of the unsung heroes. So I, I, I lean on her. Um, I lean on my aunt who took me in when I was at Warner Robins. Uh, my older brother, like absolutely, he's he's the most aggravating person <laughs> at times. But I can still I know I need his feedback. Yeah. You know I just there's some somebody that I. Uh, that I, that I definitely uh, have. So I just, I have a pillar of my bonus grandparents. They're amazing, the Dreyers. Uh, so I've been blessed to um, been loved a lot. And, and that's extremely liberating. And so I, some of my, I have mentors, plural, I do. And I got a guy that we don't talk Man, Mr. B, we don't talk all the time. We may talk once a month, but he literally sent me daily motivations, Monday through Sunday. And those sometimes, those things get me going, so yeah. It's not funny, but it's inspiring how you talk about your mentors in your mm -hmm. life and how they've impacted you so much. Mm -hmm. Because I was just talking to a young lady today who was talking about you and she was like, He's like my father figure. Like, <laughs> and I'm like, whoa. whoa. <laughs> <laughs> On LinkedIn, I saw that you call yourself a lifelong learner. Okay? Absolutely. How has being receptive to learning helped you in life? It is huge because I was the I know kid. And the I know kid is, before you finish the statement, I know. <laughs> so that was, and my mom would get so frustrated. <laughs> She's like, you don't know. Like, you know what? Like, fit, tell me what I'm about to say. He's like, I was like, I know. I'm just trying to go. I'm, I know. Like, and so being the I know kid <laughs> early on, you start to realize, I don't know nothing, you know? And so the unique thing is to be able to learn. Like, I do small things. Like, if I get in somebody's car, it used to be in the past, like, man, you need to listen to this. You need to listen to that. If I get in somebody's car, even if the music is awful mm -hmm. or whatever, it's like it's their vibe. This is their expression. Let me let me be able to sit in silence with somebody that I conversate with a lot. Let me be able to just explore uh, um, life and just be able to learn from others. I'm, Ninety percent of communication is nonverbal, so mm -hmm. being able to sit and learn has helped me more than. And sometimes I have to tell myself I can hear my mom. When somebody say something, they say, shut up, don't you respond. And I'm like, oh my God, <laughs> I, w I wanna say something right mm -hmm. now, but it's like, zip it, be quiet. And, and as she will always say, they'll reveal themselves to you. Mm -hmm. If you just be quiet, people will let you know who they are. They will. And when they let you know, just believe them. Mm-hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. That's the truth. <laughs> Absolutely. Every time you talk, I literally feel like I'm in church. Like, seriously? <laughs> no, but you have, like, a gift of ministry. You. you really do, which I know that you already know this. Um, last question. Okay. On AuburnTigers.com, it said that your mom, mm -hmm. Miss Gwendolyn Brown, mm -hmm. inspires you to be better every single day. All right. So, what is one of your favorite lessons that Miss Brown taught you? Mm, that's a good one. Um, my all right. So, my favorite lessons that she taught me was um, 
about the power of faith. And she didn't have all the money, she didn't have, but she was wealthy in some of the people that she was connected with. And um, my mom was diagnosed with cancer, and um, she was, my mom, the religious perspective I get from my mom, like, but when you grow, go, get a little older, you kind of, for me, I kind of tend to shy away from that perspective and more from a spiritual perspective. And what I saw, what I saw faith work was I saw her on her deathbed. Um, and some of the greatest lessons is what people don't say. It's what they do. I saw her on her deathbed without complaining, without um, um, just being able to be present and to still serve faith how she know how to serve it. I tell people all the time, my faith don't come from a scripture. I, 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 when somebody asks me what's my favorite scripture, I just tell them I could tell you what I recited the whole time for about three straight Easter uh, speeches. <laughs> I could tell you that, but I, I, it didn't come from a scripture. It didn't come from somebody knocking on our door and helping us. It came from I saw a strong woman who was 11 days away from her 41st birthday and died with faith. And it taught me how to live and how to go. Mm -hmm. And to be ten toes in who you are. Mm -hmm. and, and so it was no, when my mom passed, it was no, it's no secrets. Like I know, I still know stuff that some of the family don't know, you know, even when we was at the, the setting up and people, it was like, your mom, best friend. I'm like, we ain't so hard in 10 years. But all right, whatever. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, all right. right. Because they're just looking at me, I'm 12. Mm -hmm. Like, he just so young, but I was groomed as, you know, it makes sense. The, the toughest thing is it makes sense when I look back at it at 32 to realize why she was giving me so much game because we don't had, you know, a short period of time together. So that's the best lesson that she taught me. She taught me how to live and, and how to die. And that was your belief system is your belief system. No matter the circumstances in life, no matter what happens, lean into it. And when they get tougher, lean even more mm -hmm. into your belief system. And that's why I believe that you know, she's in peace. You know. She is. Mm -hmm. And everything that you said, you are a walking affirmation of that today. So I hope that you're proud of yourself. Because <laughs> yes, I, I know she's proud of you. Oh, thank you. I'm proud of you. Yes. Thank you so much for being on The World According to Jakai. Thank you. Thank you. This is I know our audience <laughs> is going to eat this up. I love it. I like love it. the knowledge and the game that you've given us. Yes. We thank you for it. On behalf of everyone, we thank you. And make sure that you guys subscribe on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and also on YouTube to The World According to Jakai. But also make sure that you guys subscribe to Eagle Eye TV's YouTube and also to Sweet 111 on SoundCloud, which is the Plainsman Newspaper Podcast. Jeff, do you have anything you want to plug before we go? The um, only thing I would say is I'm extremely grateful for the university. I'm grateful for President Chris giving me an opportunity. We were just having a conversation and I didn't know the conversation was going to go to school and I mentioned it and I was telling them some things but we didn't even finish the conversation. The next thing I know, Rich called me and saying that, hey man, let's do it. Wow. And so I just, I'm extremely, extremely grateful to President Chris. Thankful to Rich McGlynn for making it happen um, and just thankful for the Auburn community. And uh, so not only I hope I'm making my family proud, but I hope I'm making the, the Auburn family proud as well. Oh, you are. <laughs> you are. <laughs> the War Eagle. Yes, you're brightening up our days. <laughs> yes. Even in the early morning. <laughs> yes. Absolutely.
Four Eagle. Four Eagle.